If you would, turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're continuing to make our way through 1 and 2 Timothy. That's our, our goal, our plan for this summer. And um, we are calling this study uh, God's heart for his church. And so far we've seen the church and her message in chapter 1. The church and her members in chapter two. And then today we're going to look at tonight, the church and her ministers here in chapter three. And it was Pastor Warren Wiersbe, one of my favorite commentators who said about being a pastor, that it is a high and holy calling. And that is really true, that it is a sacred and serious calling to take care of God's bride. And that's what God calls his church, the bride of Christ. Isn't that amazing? That's how God looks at you, that you are his bride, that you are the bride of Christ. And some of you know this, you've heard me talk about this, but when when I got married to my wife, Denise, I was 22 years old, she was 21, and I will admit that I was terribly immature when we got married, and like a lot of young guys when they're getting married, I thought I knew everything, but I found out that I really didn't know anything about being a husband, and like a lot of young men that are getting married, my mentality about marriage was pretty selfish. I thought in this way, how was Denise going to fill my needs? How was Denise going to help me in my calling? How was Denise going to be a blessing to me in life and in ministry? And I've told you before, I had the lamest proposal ever. No ring, no plan, no fancy dinner. It was just simply, we were sitting on the couch in my apartment, and I just looked at her and said, you want to get married? (laughs) I know it was horrible. And uh, she looks at me and says, someday, you know. And then she paused her and she goes, are you proposing? And I said, yeah, I think so. <laughs> you know, it was horrible. I didn't even call her parents. I didn't call her dad, you know, ahead of time to, to ask permission. In fact, I didn't even meet her parents until after we were already engaged. And so, you know, there was no long conversation with dad. There was no, you know, qualifications that were put out. All that mattered was that she liked me and wanted to be with me. And I liked her and wanted to be with her. And it's been almost 37 years. And we have, uh, in fact, next, next Wednesday will be our 37th year anniversary. And um, so, But I'll tell you this, it's taken a lot more than love (laughs) to last 37 years. It's taken a lot of patience, a lot of hard work, and a lot of forgiveness on her part (laughs) to put up with me. And I learned in premarital counseling when I went to it, you know, somebody when we got engaged here at the church said, you know, you have to go through premarital counseling. And I thought, why? I know, I know what the Bible says, you know, uh, about being married, that husbands love your wife and wives submit. What else do I need to know? You know, and, and that was my mentality. I found out, man, I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything. But there are requirements. There are qualifications that are necessary in being a godly husband. So it shouldn't surprise you when a young man came and asked for my youngest daughter, Amanda's hand in marriage, that I grilled him. I took him out and I said, so tell me, how are you going to provide for my daughter? You know? Tell me, what's your view of, you know, a husband? I mean, we went through the list. I grilled him. And in the same way, it shouldn't surprise us that God has some pretty beefy qualifications for those who are called to take care of his bride, the church. So 1 Timothy chapter 3 gives us the qualifications and character of pastors and elders 
in the church. We'll start with pastors. Notice verse one. He says, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, and able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil." Note Paul's opening statement here where he says that this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. Now the term bishop, elder, and pastor are are three terms that are used interchangeably in scripture. They're used to describe the same role or office or person in the church. The bishop, that word means, uh, describes the ministry because the word means overseer. And so his job and his role is to oversee the flock, to watch out over the flock, that he's watching for their protection. He's watching against wolves that, that would come in. He's watching to care for them, to care for the body. So Bishop describes the ministry, overseer. The word elder describes the man, one who is spiritually mature. And then the word pastor describes the method the method of the ministry, and that's to shepherd, to feed and to tend the flock of God. And Paul says that those who desire that type of role in the family of God desire a good work. And I want you to note that he calls it work, that it is a work, that it is a vocation, that it, is, that it takes labor, that, that it is literally a, a work, it's a 24-7 type of labor. And it's important that a wife understands and has that same sense of that calling that she also, if her husband is feeling called to be in the ministry, that she would have that same type of calling too, because listen, if a guy who, who has a desire to be a pastor, one thing you need to understand if you're married, your wife and kids are going to share you with a whole lot of people that comes with the territory. There will be times when you get called away from family dinner. They'll get, there'll be times when you get called away from, you know, Saturday day off with the the family. There'll be times when you get calls on vacation that in your vacation gets interrupted. The the family as a whole has to understand that and respond to the, the, and know that, Hey, we're called to this. This is what we are called to as a married couple, as a family. Notice his qualifications that he mentions there. The first thing he mentions is that he would be blessed. Blameless. The idea he's speaking there of a godly character. The word blameless means above reproach. It's a word that speaks of being beyond accusation. And the idea is this, that if anyone were to bring an accusation against this person, against his conduct or his character, it wouldn't stick because he has an exemplary reputation. That there wouldn't be, after investigation, any merit to that accusation. And because of his outstanding character in the home and in the workplace and and in the church. Sometimes I think it would be very, very advantageous for us to, in, in a way, kind of vet 
a, a guy who feels called to be in, in the ministry, to talk with, and we do this, his, his family, and, but, but we don't go as far as, I mean, it would be interesting to go and talk to the people that he works with and see what they would say about him. So the, the first qualification is blameless, and then he talks about the idea of him, him being proven in marriage, that he is the husband of one wife. Now, literally, if you like to write in your Bible, write this, a one-woman man. Because that's what it's talking about here. It's speaking of a man who is committed to his wife. Now, does that mean that a pastor has to be married? And the answer is no. Paul the Apostle wasn't married. He wasn't, his wife had left him. He, he wasn't married. But if he is married, the idea here in saying he's a one woman man, it's not just a description against polygamy, which took place in that Roman culture, but even more so it's speaking of the idea that he's committed to his wife, fulfilling his role as a husband, or to put it this way, ministry cannot be an excuse for a man to neglect his primary ministry, which is after his relationship with Jesus, his wife. You know, the way that I view and look at my role as a pastor is in this way, that I am first and foremost a person who is in a relationship with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is the first and primary and most important relationship that I have is my relationship with Jesus. Secondly, I am a man who is in a partnership with my wife, that we are partners in this thing called min, or in marriage together. Third, I'm a parent and now a grandparent, but my relationship with my kids is very, very important. And then fourth, I'm a pastor. And that's the way that I, I like to view my calling is first, I'm a person, my relationship to Jesus. Second, my second most important relationship is my relationship to my wife. My third is my relationship to my kids. And then the, my fourth, but not last, is my relationship to the church. And that shouldn't get inverted, but it often does. It might get inverted and there might be times in, in, in situations where, you know, the pastor hat has to come on and the family, as I said before, you know, has to, to realize that, okay, there's an emergency, there's a crisis, dad has to go, somebody just died, but that can't be the norm where it's always and constantly inverted in that way. And this is a mistake that I've seen many, many pastors make. And what ends up happening is the ministry becomes their mistress. And it's easy when things are going well at the church and maybe things are strained at home to just want to spend more time at the church. Some of you men go through that same type of thing in your professions. You get validation from what you do. And, and maybe, you know, at, at home, there isn't, you know, the, the compliments all the time. You know, when I come home, Denise isn't like, oh, Mr. Wonderful's home. You know, no, I mean, we, we, we just had my son and his wife and my grandson with us for the last um, seven days. And it was wonderful having them visit us from Oklahoma. And it was also exhausting, um, especially for Denise. She was just on the entire time. So when I come home, she's not like, you know, Hey, Mr. Wonderful's here. It's like, Hey, can you help? You know? And, and, and so it's easy sometimes I've seen this happen with guys that their, their whole life gets turned out of whack because the, the ministry becomes the mistress. Now, that statement here, the husband of one wife, would seem to clearly indicate that a pastor is supposed to be a man and not a woman. And if you've been following the news lately, you are aware that this is an age-old controversy 
in the church that recently in the last couple of years has been getting kind of new traction again. And this, the controversy centers around the question, can a woman be a pastor? Can she be the lead pastor or the senior pastor in a church? Can she be an assistant pastor in a church? And just recently, if you've been following the news, several prominent churches have pulled out of the SBC. That's the Southern Baptist convention of churches over this issue. And there are two theological uh, terms that you hear associated with this issue. And if you were with us last week, uh, Rick, one of our elders was teaching here in chapter two, and he mentioned the two of these. One is the term egalitarian. And the, the idea of egalitarian is equal. That women are equal to men because both of them have been created in the image of God. And so the egalitarians say a woman can do anything that a man can do in the church. Then there are those who are called complementarians. And that word complement is the idea. They look at that the woman's role is to complement the man in his calling. Now, I want to admit that I haven't, not, I haven't done an exhaustive uh, study of this issue in my own personal studies, but I have studied it pretty well. But I haven't, you know, like studied it for years. Um, but my understanding of the scriptures based on, on this text I think it's very, this text and, and one that we'll look at in a minute, it's very, very clear that women are not to hold that role of the pastor in the church. And so our position here at Calvary Vista is that we are complementarian. And that has been the general, really agreed position within Calvary Chapel for as long as I can remember. And this text here in 1 Timothy chapter 3 is a good proof text of that, that often gets pointed to, that Paul's clear. And he says that a, a woman is to be, or excuse me, a pastor is to be the husband of one wife. Speaking of a man. So, the reason though, and this is what I want to be clear on. The reason, hear me on this. Same reason in marriage. The reason why God says that the man is to be a pastor, that the husband is to be the head in the marriage, listen to me, it's not because men are smarter. Can I get an amen, ladies? <laughs> it's not because he is more spiritual. Somebody said amen to that too. <laughs> it's not that in God's eyes, a man is better than a woman in any way. Because in, min, in many, many situations, the man isn't smarter, he isn't more spiritual, and he's definitely not better. The issue in marriage, as well as in the church, has to do with order, calling, and responsibility. That God set it up this way in marriage because it's a picture of Christ in the church. And that's the role that God gives us to the husband. He says that you are to love your wife as Christ loved the church. That's the picture. And the wife is to respond to that love like the church responds to our, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We, we love him, the Bible says, because he first loves us. And so it's a matter of responsibility. It's a matter of order. And it's a matter of calling. And as it relates to in the church, that might not make the most sense to us, but we need to trust that God is smarter than us and he knows what he's doing. So let's talk for a few minutes about the role of women in the church. Last week, as, as Rick was teaching here in chapter two, he did a good job of going through the chapter but when he got to verses 11 through 14, I think he did a good job of explaining God's heart on this situation. How many of you were here last week? Okay. 
I thought he did a good job of explaining God's heart on, on this matter, but he didn't go into the specifics of the text and really deal with what the text says. So I want to briefly hit on this tonight because it actually sets up the context of what we're dealing with tonight here in chapter three. So look back, if you would, at verse 11 and notice what Paul says. He says, let a woman learn in silence with all submission and do not permit a woman to teach. Or he says, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to be in silence for Adam was formed first, then Eve and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into tr transgression. Now, last week, Rick talked about how, how men are to be these prayer warriors in the church. And then we read Paul, you know, saying here, but, but women, they're to learn in silence and all submission. And we read that and we think, what is that about? What's the deal? I mean, that sounds chauvinistic, which Paul has been accused of by many, many people. That he was a chauvinist. Well, first of all, understand this, that phrase, let a woman learn in silence. The word silence is really a poor translation in the new King James version. The proper interpretation of the word silence would, should be this without contention. You might want to write that in your Bible. Let the, let the woman learn without contention. In fact, it's the same word used in first Timothy two verse two for the word peaceable. So he's saying, let her learn without contention. Let, let, let her be peaceable in her learning. And Paul, it's interesting. He, he taught a similar thing to the church in Corinth. And in Corinth, we know um, from, from history that the issue was in, in the church there. If you could picture the church being like our center aisles here. In that church, the men sat on one side, the women sat on the other side. They didn't sit together. So they would come in, a husband and wife, and they would separate. And they would go um, to their, their various sides because that was the culture that they were living in. Well, apparently what was happening in the church in Corinth is as the pastor would be teaching, the wife would get a question. You know, something would pop in her mind, and she would just yell out, Hey, Harry, what does he mean by that? So it was causing all this disruption in the church. So Paul had to write to them and say, let the women <laughs> learn in silence. Let, let them just, you know, be, be quiet and talk to their husbands privately about those matters. Now, I don't know if it was a similar situation in Ephesus. That's the church that Timothy's pastoring um, as he was pastoring. And, and, and if that's part of the reason why Paul is instructing in this way, or if the matter was that some of the women were just prone to challenge authority. So Paul instructs here, he says, let the women learn without contention, being in submission. So, and the idea there would be to their husbands first and to the leadership of the church. And so what Paul is telling us here is that submission is the principle and to learn in silence or without contention describes the application of that principle. The wife is to be, the woman is to be in submission. And part of that is that she's just going to hold in. She's not going to blurt out. She's not going to be contentious and challenging because God wants order in his gatherings. He doesn't want it to be a setting for debates and questions being answered. We would never get through the Bible. If you guys were always raising your hand going, what would you, what, 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 what does that mean? What does that mean? We, we would get through a verse. I mean, we would be here for 50 years before, you know, we got through a couple books of the Bible. There has to be order. And so this is the idea, but it's interesting because Paul would commend the Bereans, right? He commended them. Why? Because it says they searched, they went home and they, they, they were Bible, you know, students. So Paul would teach and they would go home and they'd break out their scrolls. They'd break out what they knew of the old Testament scriptures and they would search them to make sure what Paul was saying was true. That's the way that that's supposed to be handled. So Paul continues in verse 12, and I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to be in silence again, peaceable and not contentious. 
And really the idea of being peaceable and not contentious applies to both men and women, but he points out the, the women because it seems here in Ephesus, they were the ones having the problem. But what is meant by the phrase, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man? Well, I think Bible scholar David Gusick is very helpful here. He, he, he wrote this. The command that women should not teach or have authority over the men of the church is really one command, not two. So it's not teach and have an authority, but it's teach and have authority. It's one command command. So he's saying women should not teach in the church in a way that takes authority or replaces authority that God has ordered in the church. Gusick would say this, Paul's meaning seems clear that women are not to have a role of teaching authority in the church. And so to be under authority is the principle and not teaching is the application. So put simply, what he's saying here is the woman is not to be in that role of the teaching authority pastor in the church. Now, what's interesting about this subject is that we do see women in the New Testament were ministering in a lot of different ways. Women played a significant role in the ministry of Jesus. Women, they were the last group at the cross. It was women. None of the disciples were there, but there were women there at the cross, at the foot of the cross. Women were the first at the tomb. In fact, Mary Magdalene, she was the first person to actually see Jesus resurrected from the dead. But it's interesting, Jesus doesn't make her an apostle, even though that was one of the requirements of being apostle, that you had to see Jesus risen from the dead. In Romans chapter 16, verse 1, a lady by the name of Phoebe is called the servant of the church of Centria. Notice what he says. I'll read it to you. I commend you. I commend to you, Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church of Centria, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper to many and also to myself. The word servant here is the word deacon. It gives an indication that a, that a woman can serve in that role of a, of a deacon in the church. Regardless of Phoebe was a deacon or just, you know, Paul looks at her as a servant. She was ministering and had a prominent role in some type of ministry in the church. And Paul's saying, when she comes, receive her and do whatever she needs because she's, in, she's important. She has a role. She's helpful. In that same passage, Paul instructs the, them to greet F Priscilla and Aquila, and he calls them my fellow workers in Christ. And we'll see this in the book of Acts, that this was a husband and wife team that helped Paul in his ministry. And we read that in the book of Acts that when Apollos, this guy who was a great orator, but he wasn't really clear on his doctrine, when he kind of raises up in the church, it's Priscilla and Aquila, the husband and the wife, not just the husband, who sits him down and kind of straightens out his doctrine. And so they were used, and Priscilla was being used in that way. We read in Acts 21 verse 9 about the daughters of Philip that they were prophetesses. They were four daughters that, that all had this gift of prophesying in the church. And when we read about the gifts of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, as well as in Romans chapter 12, women are not excluded from that view of those in the church who can exercise those various gifts. My point is, is that, that women have a great role to play in the church of God. They can be used in, in incredible ways. It seems that the only thing that, that the woman can't do is be a pastor. And the reason that Paul gives for this traces back to creation. Look at verse 13. He says, for Adam was for, excuse me, formed first and then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Now, I don't have time to break this down in great detail tonight because 
our goal is to make it through chapter three. But the caution that Paul gives here is twofold. It's against a woman's curiosity and a man's passivity. You see, the, 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 the mistake that Eve made was being curious. That's why she's wandering over in the garden by the tree that she has no business being around. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Remember God said, you can eat of all the trees, except that one. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of that tree, you are going to die. And where does he find herself? Over by that tree. And who's waiting for her? Satan himself, disguised as a serpent. And he ends up deceiving her into eating that tree. But what was his temptation? It wasn't, if you eat of this fruit, you're going to feel really, really good. I mean, it's going to be the best high you've ever had. No, it wasn't that. She said, if you eat of the fruit of this tree, you're going to be like God. You're going to know good and evil. You're going to be able to discern everything. You're going to think. You're going to see things like God. And Eve was like, that sounds amazing. I want to be like God because women, you know, in the church typically have that draw towards the Lord. So Eve's mistake was that of curiosity. Adam's mistake was passivity, being passive. Why do I say that? You know, if you've been around the church a long time, you've probably heard a pastor say that, you know, Adam's mistake in the garden was he left his wife uncovered. He was off hunting, you know, and he left Eve all by herself and she ended up getting, you know, deceived. But a careful reading of the text shows us that that is not true. Look it up. What you'll see there in the book of Genesis, there at the fall, it says that an Eve took the fruit and ate of it and then gave it to her husband who was with her. The idea is Adam's sitting there watching this whole thing go down. He's sitting there watching Eve, you know, wander over by the tree. He's watching Eve having this little conversation with the the, the serpent. He's watching Eve picking the fruit and he's doing nothing. He's just being passive. And then... Because some think that Adam loved Eve more than he loved God, he went and ate of the fruit as well. That Eve was deceived, the Bible says, and Adam willingly disobeyed. And so what we see today is that men are still following in the way of Adam. There's a lot of men today in the church, unfortunately, taking a passive role and not leading their families. A lot of men who are content to, you know, oh, my wife can do devotions with the kids. Oh, my wife can be the one that prays, you know, with the family. And perhaps God knowing that that would be the natural tendency of fallen men with their families and the natural tendency of women towards spirit, spiritual things, he didn't want that in his church. The women wanting to be contentious and always challenging authority and the men just being like, hey, you want to run this thing? Go ahead. You could go ahead. Go for it. You know, because God had this order. He had this picture in mind. So let's get back to the qualifications. He's to be proven in his marriage. He's also to be proven in his character. Notice what Paul mentions next, that he is to be temperate. That means not given to extremes. Very, very important. He's to be sober-minded. That means able to think clearly and and have a, a clarity in his leading. He's to be of good behavior. That speaks of one who is orderly, that that he's in his conduct, that he's just like, you know, not somebody who's just kind of all over the place. He's to be hospitable. The idea there is in loving a stranger. Caring for people, having a heart for people, and apt to teach. In other words, able to effectively communicate God's word. And and I want to say this. That doesn't necessarily have to be from a platform like this. I've known men, in fact, we've had some on our staff who have been incredible pastors, but they weren't very gifted preachers. 
but they were apt to teach in one-on-one -on -one situations, in small group situations, and they thrived in that area, helping people to understand the word of God. So proven in his character, and then he mentions being in verse three, proven in his conduct, and the first thing he mentions here is not given to wine. Now again, if you like to write in your Bible, you might want to write next to that phrase, to not sit long with. And it carries the idea of someone who is dependent upon wine or alcohol. Not sitting long with, not being one who just like, man, I got to have a drink today and I got to have a drink tomorrow. Not being dependent upon it. You know, there's a lot of pressure in being a pastor. There's a degree of spiritual warfare that people in ministry go through that, and I don't mean this in a weird way, but a lot of people, you know, that aren't in ministry don't understand. And I have seen, unfortunately, pastors become addicted to alcohol or come, become addicted to, you know, pills because in order to cope with the stress and the pressure, they're, they're turning to that. And this is what Paul's talking about here is not being dependent upon alcohol, not being dependent upon um, those type of things. Then he mentions not being violent. The idea here would be not being abusive. We've seen that a lot today, haven't we? Of podcast and you know things that have been done in the media about abuse in the ministry, and it's it's one of the things that's to be a not a qualification. It's a qualification that not not being abusive. Peter put it this way: not lording your power over others. It's understanding that that you're there to serve others, not lord your position or authority over them. Then he mentions not given to money. When a person responds to the call of full-time ministry, they're responding to a lifestyle of less. I think it's why Paul mentions in this same sentence, not covetous. Because I think that's what can happen sometimes. I've seen this again happen with people, you know, in ministry. As they're looking around, they look at their friends, and their friends are making so much more, you know, money than they are, or live, driving a nicer car, or living in a nicer house, and they're coveting. They're, well, how come I can't have that? And then you see people in ministry, in ministries that get all off whack because they, they end up, you know, wanting to use people in order to gain funds. Paul says, no, that's not the heart. That's not the conduct. And then he mentions not quarrelsome. That's the idea of itching always for a good argument. You know, some people are that way, aren't they? They just love to push your buttons. They just want to get in an argument. They just always want to be, you know, you see on, on social media today, don't you? People always want to just stir up. He's saying, you know, somebody's called to be a pastor, an elder. They're not going to be given up. They're, they learn to walk away. They learn to redeem the time to realize, you know what? This is a conversation that I could get in. I could waste a couple hours in this conversation, but it's not going to be of any good profit. So proven in his marriage, proven in his character, proven in his conduct, and then proven in his home life. Look at verse four. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? The word rules here is the word manages. And it carries the idea of governing, leading, and giving direction to the family. But I want you to notice here that he doesn't speak of managing a business. He doesn't say one who manages his business affairs well, but one who manages his home. Why? Because the church is a family. It's not a business. It has a heavenly father, not a chairman of the board. It has brothers and sisters not shareholders. And this sometimes is a, one of the hardest lessons 
for, for guys who have come maybe out of the business world and then God calls them into the ministry world is they want to treat people in the, in the church world the way that they treated people in the business world and they forget we're, we're family. We're brothers and sisters. And so that takes a lot more grace. That takes a lot more patience. You know, what do you do when you have a company and somebody just isn't cutting the mustard, you know? They're not able to do their, their job well. You let them go. It might be hard. It might, you know, you might think, oh, I like that guy, but, you know, we, we got it. He's just bringing us down. I, I just, I got to let him go. And then, and then, you know, a week or so later, you don't think about it anymore. Because you're on, you know, you're on to the next thing. And nobody in the company is like, man, I'm going to quit because they let go of Harvey, you know. No, they're not thinking that way. But, you know, in the church, we're all interconnected. There's all these connections. There's all these relationships. And one person, you know, if they feel like they, they don't get treated right and they share that with somebody else and then they share that with somebody else and pretty soon there's this schism in the family because we're connected. We're brothers and sisters. And so we, we have to have an abundance of grace and patience with one another because that's what you do in a family, right? You know, none of you are like, you know, to your eight-year-old because for three nights in a row they didn't eat their dinner. You're like, okay, you're, you're out. You know, you're out of the family. Pack your bags. You're out of here. No, you, you have patience. You're dealing with them. You're ministering to them. You're having patience with them. So it's also interesting here that the word children, we talked about this in our Titus study, um, is the word technon, which refers to children in the home who are of formative age. So those children who are in their late teens or those children who are out of the house, they're not applicable here. It's talking about he's ruling his house. Those, those children, those kids that are in that formative age that he rules, he manages his house well. Also, the word children here is plural, meaning that when we look at somebody who is, you know, being that we're considering this, he have the qualifications to be in that place of ministry that we're, we're, we have to look at all the kids. And this is something I think is very, very important because if a man has four kids and three of them love Jesus, and three of them are just great kids and well-behaved, but he has one that is a prodigal, that doesn't necessarily disqualify him. He's judged by, what Paul's saying here, he's judged by the family as a whole, by all of the kids. Now, if all of the kids are rebellious and want nothing to do with God, I don't care how great that of a Bible teacher a guy like that is, I, I, don't, I think he's disqualified. It's his family. How can, Paul says, how can he manage the house of God if he can't manage his own family? So he's proven in his home life. And then the next thing he mentions is he's proven in his experience. He, he says they're not a novice. The idea there is he's not a new believer. He's not somebody that's just new, you know, in the Lord or new in ministry that, that you just want to say, all right, you know, we got a live one. Here you go. You want to, you know, you want a responsibility. And I see that happen sometimes in the church. Paul says, no, 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 because he'll get puffed up with pride. Why was the devil? Why was Lucifer condemned? He got puffed up with pride. That's why he was kicked out of heaven, we're told in Isaiah chapter 14. So Paul warns Timothy to not place a novice in a position of leadership because novices tend to think if anything good happens through them, it's because of them. And they get puffed up. Here's something that's really, really interesting about ministry. God is faithful to his word. It's the word of God that's living and powerful. It's the word of God that, that changes lives. But we have this tendency sometimes to think, you know, oh, I did that. No, no, it was God using his word. 
Those who have, you know, been around a while, who've grown and matured in the relationship with the Lord, they understand that if anything good happens, you know, it's not because of them, but it's in spite of them that God was moving and working. But Satan enjoys seeing a young pastor succeed and get proud because then he can tear him down. So proven in his relationships, um, or proven in his, in his character, his conduct, his family, proven in his experience. And then uh, the last thing we see here is proven in his relationships outside of the church, verse 7, that he has a good testimony, a good reputation with those outside of the church. Oftentimes when I'm interviewing somebody that we're considering, you know, to maybe bring on part of our pastoral team, I like to take them out to lunch and see how they are with the waitress, the waiter, especially if things don't go right. See how they are outside. Looking for that. What's the reputation that they have? If we could go and talk to their neighbors and say, hey, tell me, what's, what's Joe like? You know, what's he like as a neighbor? You know, this is the idea that they'd have a good reputation with those outside of the church. And so I think we could sum up what Paul is saying here in this way, that there are five confirmations that point to a man's calling. First of all, the man points to himself. It starts with a desire. I think God might be calling me into the ministry. The second is the Holy Spirit points to the man where the fruit of the Spirit is evident in his life and you see that in his conduct. The next thing we could say is that the current leadership points to the man that they recognize and they bear witness with his calling and that he's not a novice, that he is somebody that's mature in the Lord. Uh, the, the third would be, or the fourth would be that the family points to the man, that his household, his kids and his wife, that they, you look at them and you see the Lord in them and the Lord in this house that it's being managed well. And then lastly, that the sheep would point to the man. And this is why I've always said that I don't think our body should ever be surprised if we were to appoint somebody as part of our leadership team or a pastor that we bring them up here and say, well, we're going to pray over so-and-so today, you know, because God has called them, you know, be a part of our leadership team or part of our, you know, pastoral team, that, that the church that you guys would go, that guy, really? No, that the, the church would be like, oh, that makes sense because I've been watching him for a long time. I had a conversation with him two weeks. He ministered to me. You know, I, a couple weeks ago, I was, I was really down. He was praying for me that they would see that already in that individual. So those are the qualifications of an elder. Next we see is the qualifications of the deacon in verse eight. Turn there. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience, but let these also first be tested and then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanders, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own house, their own house as well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and a great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. The first thing that you notice in this list is that the qualifications are very, very similar. So here's the question. What's the difference between the deacon and the elder in the church. I would explain it in this way. Elders deal with the word of God and the people of God. That's kind of their main focus. Where deacons are dealing with the practical aspects of the church so that the elders, the pastors, can devote their time to the teaching of the word of God, to prayer and, and ministering to the needs of the people of God. 
We see this in Acts chapter 6. Remember, we looked at this a while back in our study through the book of Acts, where it says that there was a, a complaint that arose in the church where the Hellenistic widows felt like they were kind of being shortchanged in the distribution of the food. So what did the apostles do? They said, choose from among yourselves seven men who are full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit who can take care of these things because it's not good for us to step away from our calling to, to, to be in the word and in prayer in order to serve tables. So pick some guys, faithful, spirit-filled guys who can handle the practical aspects so that we can focus on the spiritual aspects. So this is the idea of the deacon. But even though the role of the deacon is to minister in practical areas, their calling and qualifications are just as serious. He says, likewise, deacons must be reverent. And the word in the Greek there for reverent carries the idea of gravity. It's meaning that the person called to be a deacon understands the weightiness of their calling, that they realize that it's serious and it's important. And so for that reason, they have to be proven in their motives and their attachments. So he mentions there in verse eight, not double tongued. The idea is that a man or even a woman who that, that their yes is, is yes and their no is no, that they're not double-tongued. The idea is like you can count on them. When they say they're going to be there, they're going to be there. He mentions also here not given to much wine. It's interesting that the word given here is different from the word used for elders in the Greek. For the elder, the, word, the Greek word used for given there was he doesn't sit long with. And I mentioned the idea is he's not dependent upon it. But the, for the deacon, the word means that giving himself to, and it adds the word much in here. Much that, that or in great amounts. So for the elder to use alcohol or substances as a crutch or a support or a coping me mechanism, th that's not to be. But for the deacon, it's speaking more in a general sense that the deacon can't be one who's just a drunkard. A one who's just always, you know, given himself over to alcoholic consumption. He has to be clear headed and clear minded. He mentions not greedy for money. The idea is always looking to make a deal or make merchandise with the people of God. We've literally here had to tell certain people over the years, hey, we don't want to hear you. We don't want to see you making deals here at church. Because sometimes people think that way. You know, they come and they see, you know, several hundred people here on a, on a Sunday and, and they're like at each service and they're like, you know, oh, here's an opportunity, you know. And we've literally had to come alongside people and say, we don't want you doing that here. Don't be handing out your business cards. Don't be, you know, always talking about that's not what the purpose of this is here. Is, is that's that the idea. He also has to be one who is doctrinally sound. Notice how he puts it. Holding the mystery of faith with a pure conscience. And I think the reason for this is that they appreciate the word of God so much that they want to do whatever they can to make sure that their pastors have enough time to study. Because the deacons know the, the power of the word of God and they want to see it go forth. And they're also men who know the word of God themselves. And that's important because no matter what ministry that you are in, you're always going to be involved with people because that's what ministry is. So deacons so enjoy serving the, 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 in the practical ways because they want to see the word of God going forth. The next thing we see is that they're proven also in their experience. Look at verse 10. But let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. The idea of tested here carries the idea of being in, in a trial period. That they're to be, to be tested to see, okay, are they faithful? Can we, can we trust them? Are they going to show up? Are they men who are dependable? 
Are they men who, when they're, when they're given a responsibility that they, you know, you can count on them. And what, what that looks like here is, you know, Jesus said, if you're faithful in the little things, you'll be exalted with greater things. And so that, that's the way it often works is somebody, you know, serving in, in, in one simple area and you say, hey, they're faithful. Let's give them a little bit more responsibility. But it's not just the men that Paul draws attention to, but it's also their wives. And this is, again, a big mistake that often happens in church world. I've seen pastors who are so desperate for help, and they see a guy that just seems great, but they completely ignore where his wife is at, where his family's at. So in verse 11, Paul says, Likewise, their, their wives must be reverent. Their wives need to understand the gravity of their husband's calling. They need to not be slanders, false accusers, stirring up strife, gossips is the idea there. That they're temperate, he says, under control in their concern and their emotions and in faithful in all things are trustworthy. And then he tells us the deacon's prize, verse 13. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Jesus Christ. Two things will result in the service of a deacon who's serving in a right way. First, it will create a great sense of appreciation on a part of the congregation. That the body's just like, man, I love that guy. And I, you know, I, I love, I love guys like Mike Bracci sitting back here, who's just here all the time, always faithful, has been for years. Years and just helping us in this deacon kind of way here at the church. And there's a lot of guys. Ernie's another one who's back there tonight. And these guys, Bill, Bill Wright. These guys, Bill Wright, man, the guy does so much stuff behind the scenes to get the word of God out. And I love that. And our body has just been blessed over the years. And I think that the people who see and know, a lot of times what these guys are doing, no one sees it. But those who do say, oh, they so appreciate it. I so appreciate it. The second thing that Paul says is most interesting. He says that the deacons earn for themselves a great confidence in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. The word confidence there is boldness. And I think the idea in this is that whenever you are involved in ministry and you're seeing that what you're doing, that God is moving and working, it gives you a confidence. It gives you a sense of boldness. Like, man, I want to do that more. I want to do that more. I mean, how, how beautiful was it on Sunday to watch those people after each service get baptized? Wasn't that neat? Somebody said to me after, you know, the service, that's got to be the, the most, the favorite part or the best part of your job. And, and she was right. Like, I, I do. I love that. But what a lot of people don't realize is that somebody was here on Friday setting up the pool Somebody was here on Saturday putting in the water and making sure it was heated because, you know, I don't want, I don't care, but I don't want the people to be cold. You know, no, I care too. Um, (laughs) You know, in the water. So they had it heated to like 90 degrees. It was wonderful, you know. But no one sees. No one sees that. They just rejoice. But for the people who who see that, you know, and that, that are part of that, it's like, oh, man, praise God. That's so awesome. I'm so glad I got to set up that baptismal that day. Now, Paul concludes this section on the church leadership by making two wonderful statements, and we're going to wrap this up about the church. Verse 14, it says, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. Note this. I love this. First of all, that he mentions, he calls it, we already talked about this, that the church is the house of God. You know, sometimes we we like to say that the church is a hospital. And I get that. Because it is a place for the hurting. But I've had two hip replacements. Three hip operations. I've been in the hospital. And you know what? I couldn't wait to get home. When I was in the hospital, I wasn't like, can I just say two more days? It was like, like, no, you're you're going to let me home tomorrow? Great. I can't wait to get home. I don't like this place. I'm tired of this jello. You know, it's like I want out of here. 
you know, I feel comfortable in the hospital. So I get the idea, but he calls it the, the house of God because this is a family. And then he mentions the pillar and ground of the truth. And this is an architectural image that would mean much to Timothy who was pastoring in Ephesus because Ephesus was known for their pillars. The temple of Diana, which is one of the seven wonders of the world, get this, had 127 pillars. And every one was a gift of a king and all were made of marble. Some were studded with jewels. Some were overlaid with gold. The pillars support, they hold up the structure. In Ephesus, the pillars were used, had a twofold purpose to support, but also to display beauty. And the church is built upon the pillar of Jesus Christ, the person and work of Jesus Christ. And, and that's what, what we stand upon. But it's also the truth that we're to put on display for all to see. And that's how Paul ends this. He puts on display the greatness of the Lord, when he says this, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifested in the flesh. This is the mystery, was that God, in the person of Jesus, left heaven, came to this earth, became a man. Paul puts it this way in Corinthians. He says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So Paul finishes up this great statement here in chapter three as this pillar to put on display, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, probably a reference to his baptism, seen by the angels, probably a reference to the resurrection, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world and received up into glory. And we all say, amen. amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that in your word you lay out for us that this thing, this calling that you've given to some of pastoring, being elders, being deacons, is a high and holy calling. And Lord, I pray for all of us here who are in those type of roles here at Calvary Vista that we wouldn't take it for granted, the role that you've given us. That we wouldn't look at it as a light thing, as a common thing, but that we would see it as a holy thing. And Lord, we're reminded that you, you tell us in the book of Ephesians that the purpose of pastors and elders is to equip the church as a whole for the work of the ministry. That we as a family here at Calvary Vista, that we would all be using our gifts, men and women, that we'd be using our talents, that we'd be responding to the calling that you've given to each one of us. That in this thing that you call the family of God here that we are a part of, that we would all realize that none of us are meant to be spectators. None of us are meant to just be consumers. But that all of us have a role to play. And Lord, I pray that you would be raising up in this body of believers more men into those elder type roles. Men who have a heart to oversee and watch over the flock. Men who are mature. Men who have that heart to shepherd and tend the flock. God, I pray that you would be raising up men and women in those servant roles to serve practically here. And God, I'm so thankful for the many, many servants that 
we do have. Many the, those who volunteer their time and their gifts that allow us as a church to do way more than we should be able to do for a church of this size. And we thank you, God, that through that ministry, your, your word goes forth and your word goes out. Lord, I pray for anybody here tonight that maybe is just unsure of their calling. That as they, they would seek you and look for ways and opportunities to respond, to see. And maybe discover the calling and the place, the calling you have on their life and the place that they have in the body. Lord, we thank you that you are a God of order, that you are a God of structure. And even in the things that we don't fully understand, Lord, we just want to submit to your leadership. And so we give you our hearts tonight, God. In Jesus' name.